Okay, so this is the um, physical activity and immobility lecture, chapter 32 in your F.A. Davis book. So we have our key terms yet again. We have our objectives. And we're going to talk about some concepts regarding this. So mobility, um, very simply, is your body movement. Fitness is going to be the ability to carry out activities of daily living with vigor and alertness without undue fatigue and with enough energy for leisure pursuits in response to emergencies. Physical activity is the body movement produced by contraction of skeletal muscle that increases energy expenditure uh, above your baseline. And then exercise um, is a subconcept of physical activity. And it's planned, structured, repetitive, and purposeful for improving or maintaining our, our physical fitness, our physical performance, and our health. Um, and then we're going to break things down by body system. So we have our principles of body mechanics. Body mechanics is a term used to describe the way we move our bodies. It includes components of body alignment, balance, coordination, and joint mobility. Body alignment is going to be also known as posture. Um, it's an important aspect of body mechanics. We need proper posture and neutral spine um, to reduce our risk of injury. Um, it's going to help our bones align, our muscles and joints and ligaments to work at their peak efficiency. Um, we want to make sure that we achieve balance when we're aligned. Um, for your body to be balanced, your line of gravity must pass through the center of your gravity, and the center of gravity must be close to the base of your support. So the line of gravity is an imaginary vertical line drawn from the top of the head through the center. The center of the gravity is the point around which mass is distributed. In the human body, the center of gravity is our umbilicus at the top of the pelvis, and the base of support is what holds the body up. The feet provide a base support. When we talk about coordination, coordination is smooth movement, requires coordination between your nervous system and your musculoskeletal system. Your cerebral cortex initiates voluntary movements. Your cerebellum coordinates movements largely responsible for controlling your proprioception, the awareness of your postures, your movement, and your position of sense. Your basal ganglia located in the cerebellum assists with coordination of movement. Damage to the motor cortex, cerebellum, or basal ganglia affects coordination of movements. So a patient having a stroke is going to have like alterations in their gait and changes in their posture. All of this you're going to be going over again when you get to neuro. We also have our joint movement, which allows us to sit up, stand, bend, walk, and perform other activities. Every joint, right? Our body is filled with joints. Your neck has joints in it. Your back has joints in it. All of them have a range of motion, which is the maximum movement of that joint. We have active range of motion, which is how the patient can move joint. And then we have passive range of motion, which is how we could move it for the patient. Somebody who has like a shoulder injury, they might not be able to lift their like rotator cuff um, injury. They're not going to be able to lift their arm up to um, the full level of their shoulder. They're only going to be able to go up so far, but you can passively move it up for them. And that's how we usually know that it's a rotator cuff injury. So some body mechanics to avoid an injury, right? These are what you want to do when you're handling your patients to reduce the chance of you hurting yourself. You're going to want to use a wide base of support. It means that you're spreading your feet apart. You're wanting to shoulder width apart, right? We're not going, you know, ridiculously far apart where you're getting into a sumo stance to shoulder length apart. You want to minimize bending and twisting. Um, you want to Tighten your abdominal muscles, really contract your um, core, right? Your abdominal muscles is your core. You want to squat to lift heavy objects from the floor because squatting, squatting lowers your center of gravity, um, pushing against strong hips and thigh muscles to raise up, right? We don't want to go up um, 
with our back. We want to use those hips and those thigh muscles. We want to use, again, muscles in your legs, keep objects close to your body. You want to make sure that you're using both hands and arms when you lift, move, or carry heavy objects. You do not want to be standing on your tiptoes to reach an object. It would be better to use a ladder or a step stool. Um, you know, in lab, I use the example, if you're a short person and you're lifting with a tall person, that bed really needs to be at that tall person's waist level. You can't adequately lift, so you might need to get a step stool. Um, you just need to do what's safe for the two of you. Push, slide, or pull heavy objects when possible rather than lifting. Maintain a good grip. Um, when possible, keep your elbows bent when you carry an object. Work with smooth, smooth and even movements. So avoid those sudden or jerky movements. Above all, use the lift equipment that your hospital has. So if you have a transfer board, use a transfer board. If you have um, a Hoyer lift, use the Hoyer lift whenever we're lifting or transferring a patient, right? Because if we just rely on our body mechanics, we're still going to possibly hurt ourselves. But if we're using that equipment, it decreases the chance that we're going to hurt ourselves because it's making it easier on us. Well, types of exercise. So you can have isometric exercise. This involves muscle contraction without motion. These exercises are usually performed against an immovable surface or object. For example, pressing hands against a wall. Each position is held for about six to eight seconds and repeated five to 10 times. Isometric training is effective for developing um, strength of a muscle group and requires no special equipment. Isotonic exercise involves the movement of a joint during a muscle contraction. A classic example of an isotonic exercise is weight training with free weights. As the weight is moved through the range of motion, the muscle shortens and lengthens. Calisthenics, such as pull-ups, push-ups, and planks, all use body weight as the resistance of force, and these are all isotonic exercises. Isokinetic exercise is performed with specialized apparatus that provide variable resistance to movement. Isotonic exercise combines the best features of both isometric and weight training by providing resistance at a constant speed while the muscle moves through the full range of motions. Machines available at health clubs and physical therapy departments are used for this form of exercise. We have aerobic exercise, which occurs when the amount of oxygen taken by the body meets or exceeds the amount of oxygen required to perform the activity. Aerobic exercise uses large muscle groups, can be maintained continuously and a rhythmic nature. It increases the heart rate and the respiratory rate, thereby providing exercise for cardiovascular system while simultaneously exercising our skeletal muscles. Jogging, brisk walking, and cycling are all common forms of aerobic exercise. Then we have anaerobic exercise, which occurs when the amount of oxygen taken by the body does not meet the amount of oxygen required to perform the activity. Therefore, muscle must obtain energy from metabolic pathway that does not use oxygen. Rapid intense exercise, such as lifting heavy objects or sprinting, are examples of anaerobic exercise. So why do we exercise? There's plenty of benefits behind it. Regular physical activity a week sustained for months and years can produce long-term health benefits. Strong evidence links regular physical activity with a lower risk of early death, heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, metabolic syndrome, colon and breast cancer, and depression along with nutritious diets, social engagement, and mentally stimulating activities, physical activity is associated with a reduced risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. The American Heart Association right now is recommending that we get 300 minutes of exercise a week for optimal, but acceptable is 150. When we're doing um, exercise programs, we want to make sure that it's a well-rounded fitness program focused on flexibility, resistance, and aerobic. The mode of exercise is the type of activity, aerobic endurance, and muscle strengthening. Physical activities both promote better health. 
Flexibility is going to be training before exercise. It's going to help warm up the muscles and therefore prevent injury during exercise. Stretching after exercise cools the muscles down and limits the post-exercise stiffness because it's helping to move that lactic acid out of the muscle. Resistance training is movement against resistance and increased muscular strength and endurance. Perhaps the most common type of resistance training is weightlifting. We have exercising for strength, which is going to increase the amount of resistance with each exercise, you know, lifting more weight. We have exercising for endurance, which is increase the number of repetition for each exercise. Aerobic conditioning is fitness and body composition are improved by aerobic conditioning. Components of aerobic conditioning include intensity, duration, frequency, and mode. Intensity is how hard one exercise. And then the amount of physical activity. Um, duration is the amount of time of exercising and frequently would be how often we exercise. Um, and in another lecture that we talked about, you know, um, as we get a little bit older, we don't have time in our week to exercise every day. So our frequency reduces um, and then people will try and push it to keep the same amount of duration. And that's when they could potentially have injuries. Um, again, the benefits and risk of exercise. So the benefits, um, you know, brisk walking for as little as 30 minutes a day when done consistently promotes weight loss, um, maintenance of normal weight. It lowers the risk of disability, reduces the loss of our bone density, and it promotes better heart and lung function. Um, if we start doing moderate intensity, it helps to improve strength, balance, muscle tone, um, reduces our falls, improves our overall physical stamina, enhances our um, psychological well-being risks, right? We can have a cardiac injury. Um, fear of triggering a cardiac event deters some people from exercising. Um, that's one of the reasons why we've developed cardiac rehab because many times when patients have those MIs, they don't want to risk having another injury. Muscular skeletal injury, high impact exercises may pose a risk to injure bones, joints, and muscles. Um, I had a friend who was big into weightlifting and they suffered a pathological fracture from lifting too much weight. Um, their muscle could handle it. Their bone couldn't. Dehydration, right? So if we're exercising a whole bunch, we're going to be losing our fluids and altering our electrolytes. Um, we're going to have high ambient temperatures, certain medications and underlying health problems can exacerbate this. Um, so we need to make sure that we keep in mind that the patient's becoming well hydrated. Um, and we might want to tell them to do some sports drinks and be cautious. Some sports drinks can have a lot of sugar. So the diabetic patient is definitely going to have to put back the electrolytes they lost but we don't want to compound their diabetes by them having sugary drinks, which is why companies like Gatorade have made sugar free ones. Um, and then temperature regulation problems, right? Um, if you have somebody who's exercising in a really hot climate, um, they can become hyperthermic. Which, you know, that's that too high of temperature, um, which is also going to be worsened because they're going to become dehydrated. Um, heat exhaustion, again, um, signs of heat exhaustion would be lightheaded, nausea, headaches, fatigue, hyperventilation, loss of concentration, abdominal cramps, elevated temperature, and cold, clammy skin. Um, and then we can also have hypothermia if we're exercising outside and it's super cold out. You know, a lot of runners run all the time. If they then go to a climate that's colder, um, you know, they can, they can become too cold. Um, one thing that I also want to say when we're talking about, um, hypothermia or heat exhaustion, um, and these people are worried about dehydration. If they flood themselves with just water, it can actually further dilute their electrolytes and cause them to have, um, even worsening of those um, nauseas and vomitings and all of that headaches and things like that. So some factors that affect our mobility, our developmental stage as expected, older adults um, that are least active 
but were more likely to participate in physical fitness activity rather than sporting and outdoors. Um, so you just need to, you know, kind of know where your patient is in that developmental stage. Um, nutrition, right? Obesity leads to many health problems, um, which, you know, further reduces their activity because of the obesity. So it's kind of like a circle of um, problems. Um, movement becomes more difficult as the body increases in size. Joints and back injuries and osteoarthritis are more prevalent in the obese, which those in turn reduce their ability to engage in physical activity for weight loss. Um, some chronic diseases may be um, given negative nitrogen balance. That is, they do not have adequate protein stores available to maintain or repair the body tissues. So they start to have muscle wasting and fatigue, which lead to a reduced activity levels, loss of strength and balance. Lifestyle, personal values about exercises and fitness um, determine when or whether exercise become part of a person's normal routine. Some people enjoy exercise. Others see it purely as something they have to do. Um, a person's culture and support system define what exercise the person is likely to choose. Environmental factors right? Whether when it's cold, damp, or even too hot or humid, people tend to avoid strenuous outdoor activities and they want to stay inside. And we want to encourage patients to choose a variety of activities that they can enjoy so they can exercise regardless of the weather. So if your patient needs to stay inside, maybe they can do steps around the house. Maybe they can climb their stairs. Maybe they can do some vacuuming, vigorous cleaning. They can do yoga, um, things that you don't necessarily need equipment for. Pollution, right? We all know the air quality is poor. Um, and when you're exposed to allergens or you have allergens or heavy pollutants, it makes it hard to go outside and do activities because you can't breathe well. Um, neighborhood conditions. If you live in an area that has high crime, you're not going to want to go walking um, outside, but you might be able to suggest to a patient to go walk, you know, at the outlets or go walk at a mall. Not that there's many malls left anymore, but. Um, finances, fitness clubs are not cheap. So not everybody can afford to join a fitness club. Um, but there might be other community activities or walking groups or, um, parks that can be inexpensive or free. Um, and then always a support system. Support systems are really important. Um, if you have somebody who has multiple friends that are exercising, those friends are going to support them and continue into exercise. If all of their friends are gamers and don't go outside, they're not going to have that same support. So looking at our muscular skeletal system, um, this is kind of when your book first introduces some common diseases um, that you guys are going to want to know. So we have diseases of the joints may be considered degenerative or inflammatory. Nursing activity for your patients with joint mobility problems focuses on assisting them with movement, providing them comfort, teaching them about their medications. If mobility is severely restricted, you must, um, you're going to have to assist your patient with activities of daily living. You might also have to um, assist your patient with um, range of motion exercises. Um, you might have to advocate for physical therapy, occupational therapy, and things of that nature. So osteoarthritis is the first one that your book talks about. Um, it is one of the most prevalent type of degenerative joint disorders. Osteoarthritis involves the loss of the articulate cartilage in the joint with pain, stiffness is the primary symptom. The patient may also have decreased range of motion and they might have crepitus. So it will be a creaking or grating sound with any joint motion. Symptoms are aggravated by um, weight bearing and joint use, and they're usually relieved by resting the joint. Osteoarthritis is more common in women, older adults, and people who are overweight. The next one we talk about is rheumatoid arthritis, also known as RA. 
This is a systemic autoimmune disease involving chronic inflammatory changes of the joints and surrounding connective tissue, frequently resulting in difficulty in performing activities of daily living. RA causes joint pain, deformity, loss of function. Patients can also experience fever, fatigue, weakness, and weight loss. RA occurs most frequently in the fingers, the wrists, the elbows, the ankles, the knees, not in big joints like the shoulders and the hips. The illness usually begins in the middle of life. It's more often in women. Unlike osteoarthritis, RA does not improve with rest. Pain is most intense when the person arises from bed. Pain and joint deformities may be so severely affecting mobility that the patient can no longer care for themselves. Um, then it talks about alkalizing splendidosis. Um, this is a chronic inflammatory joint disease characterized by stiffening infusion of the spine and your um, SI joints. The inflammation occurs where the ligaments, tendons, and joint capsules insert into the bone. The disease usually develops in young adults. It's equal in men and women. Um, patients with this have low back pain, stiffness, and decreased range of motion. The convex um, lumbar curve is slowly lost, and the upper spine curve increases, causing kyphosis. We also have gout. So gout is caused by um, uriatic acid collecting in the body and forming crystals in the synovial fluid. And sometimes um, these little things called toffees, T-O-P-H-I, which are these small round nodules that you'll see um, on the skin. Um, under your subcutaneous tissue. Gout produces painful joints and it severely limits the activity during its flare-up. It usually affects the great toe, but can occur in the feet, ankles, um, really any joint. If a patient has gout, they're going to want to limit their foods that contain um, uriatic acid so that would be um, processed foods, a lot of seafoods, um, sodas, wines, things like that. Next, we have osteoporosis, which is a decrease in total bone density. Um, it occurs when osteoclast activity outspaces that of the osteoblast. The internal structure of the bone diminishes and the bone collapses in on itself. Normally, bone mass continues to increase up into our third decade of life. After age 30, our bone loss starts to begin. Women experience a rapid decline of bone loss during menopause. In men, um, a gradual loss continues. As our bones become more porous, they become weak, leading to those collapses. Um, patients can have just fractures of their long bones and their arms without even doing anything. They can occur spontaneously or with extremely light trauma. So you can be like, oh, I barely touched them and their bone just broke. Well, when they take an x-ray, they'll see that they have osteoporosis. Um, genetics, body frames, menopause status, chronic disease, lifestyle choices can all play a role in this. The most common risk factors for um, these factors are advanced age, low bone mineral density, previous fractures as an adult, smoking, low calcium, vitamin D intake, um, excessive alcohol, sedentary lifestyle. We then move on to osteomyelitis, which is an infection in the bone. It can develop after a bone injury or surgery. It can be difficult and expensive to treat. Um, a lot of time our drug users will get osteomyelitis um, from missing their vein and nicking their bone with a dirty needle. Um, once the bacteria enters the channel, they multiply rapidly um, and an infected bone can take a very long time to heal. Um, patients typically will end up needing some type of central access and being on long-term IV antibiotics. Um, your bone talks about bone tumors, 
Um, again, tumors in the bone um, are going to be painful. They're going to limit the patient's activity. Um, the nurse is going to want to make sure that she's collaborating on treatments, patient education, treatment plans, and providing care. Uh, we can have trauma that can affect our bones. Um, so trauma could be a fracture of the bone, which is a break in the bone. Um, this is going to be seen on an x-ray. We can have sprains and strains that are more common than fractures. Your sprain is going to be the stretching of a ligament that's going to cause it to tear. You can have a partial tear of a ligament. And then the strain is going to be the injury to the muscle. Both strains and sprains cause pain at the site of injury. They have swelling. They're going to have reduced functions. The signs um, of those two are going to be the same as a fracture. Um, however, x-ray studies um, are not going to be able to distinguish these injuries, which one it is. Um, the treatment for um, fractures, sprains, and strains is always going to be the rice, which is um, rest, ice, compress, and elevate. And now we're going to move on to our patient positions. Um, certain positions are going to help you with certain things. Um, Fowlers and high Fowlers are what you're going to want to put a patient in um, to help with breathing, right? Semi Fowlers is 30 degrees. High Fowlers is 90 degrees. Um, a lateral position or um, Sims position is going to help to take weight off their bottom area um, and redistribute it to reduce pressure ulcers. Prone, we did a lot of prone during COVID time. And then supine um, is sometimes known as dorsal recumbent position. This is when the patient lies on their back, shoulders are elevated on a small pillow. Um, most patients prefer to be in a low Fowler's um, over supine, it seems in my experience. Moving a patient up in bed. So when we move a patient up in bed, we need to remember that many of our patients are very frail. They're gonna continue to slide down because gravity is going to pull them down. Um, we're gonna wanna make sure that we um, do not drag them up in bed, right? A lot of times when people slide them up in bed, we say we're sliding you up in bed, but it's really supposed to be a lift up into bed. Um, turning our patients, we should be turning our frail and immobile patients at minimum every two hours to reduce um, them getting a skin injury or other complications from immobility. And then log rolling is a special turning technique. Um, somebody is going to make sure that they control the head. Um, and then we usually have two people on one side and one person on the other side and somebody at the head. So four people, um, minimal of three to log roll a patient. And the idea is that you're keeping that spine in alignment in straight alignment when you're moving them over. When we're helping our patients out of bed, your number one resource for helping would be um, physical therapy. They're great at getting people up and out, but sometimes your patient is not getting out of bed for a reason that they need physical therapy. Um, we might be getting them out of bed just because we have to transfer them for a procedure. Um, so things that we can use is a transfer board. A transfer board um, is going to be, we can have transfer boards like this small one that's going to help them go. Um, it's a plank that we put under them and it'll slide them from the bed to the chair. We also have long transfer boards that can extend the whole way of a, a bed to a stretcher. Um, and you basically, you know, put the patient half on the board and then they kind of just slide over the board. Um, we can have mechanical lifts. Mechanical lifts are especially useful when providing care for our obese and immobile patient. Lifts are often used in home care because they allow one person to safely transfer a patient. Most lifts position patients in a seated position and thus are ideal for assisting the patient into the chair. Many include scales to help weigh them and any mechanical lift or any of these um, devices 
We want to make sure we use them because they reduce our risk of being injured as a healthcare provider. We can have standing assists um, and then transfer belts. When we're ambulating with our patient, right, we can do a few different type of physical conditionings. Patients who have been confined to bed for more than a week or who have sustained a major injury require conditioning before they are able to resume walking. Conditioning exercises include quadricep and gluteal drills. These quadricep muscle groups and gluteal muscles are the largest muscles in the body. Patients who are confined to a bed can perform those isometric, so contracting of those muscles. Um, we can do arm exercises. So the patient can do bicep and triceps while they're in the bed. Um, so when they're using their crutches, their arms are a little bit stronger. We need to be mindful of any cardiac or muscle skeletal precautions or restrictions the patient might have with arm movements. Um, like if your patient has a pacemaker put in, um, if it's brand new, they're not going to want them to lift that arm all the way up. Um, or they might not want them to carry heavy things on that side. That's what that's talking about. Um, dangling. So whenever we have a patient who's laying for a while, we like to have them sit up and sit at the edge of the bed. Um, this is kind of prepare them to get to a chair and, and ambulate. Patients who are confined to the bed for a long time could develop orthostatic hypertension, which is that drop in the blood pressure, which can make them dizzy. So by dangling, it reduces that chance. And then we always want to use those assist devices, right? Always try to use an assist device like a cane, a walker, a brace, or a crutch for the patient's safety and for your safety. So um, your body is going to have some um, effects of being immobile. One of the biggest effects of being immobile is the fact that um, your skin, right, there's going to be decreased circulation to that skin because they're laying on it and that can lead to a pressure injury. The respiratory system has decreased respiratory movement, resulting in decreased oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. Patient can have a stasis of secretions, meaning they're not really moving that stuff up and around. And they're at an increased risk for atelectasis when the alveoli aren't opening up all the way, which can then turn into pneumonia. Your cardiovascular system, we've already said if they've been laying for a long time, they might end up having orthostatic hypotension, which is why we're going to want to dangle them. Um, they could have less fluid volume in the circulatory system. They can have stasis of blood in their legs, which puts them at an increased risk for um, deep vein thrombosis, DVTs, or clots. They're going to have um, diminished autonomic responses, decreased cardiac output, leading to poor cardiac effectiveness, which is going to increase their workload, making it harder for their heart to pump and get oxygen everywhere it needs to be. Their um, metabolic syndrome is going to have alterations in the endocrine system because they have a decreased metabolic rate, right? Their body's been laying, they haven't been doing a lot, so their body's not having that metabolic rate that they normally would if they were at up and about and moving. This is going to change their protein requirements, their carbohydrate requirements, and their fat metabolism. They're going to have a decrease in appetite. They're going to have an altered intake. Um, they're also going to have a negative nitrogen balance, decrease protein that's going to result in muscle loss, weight loss. They're going to have alterations of their calcium, fluid, and electrolytes, a reduction in their urine elimination, um, and that's going to result in an elevated um, calcium level. They'll have hypercalcemia. With elimination, their GU is going to have urinary stasis. Change in that calcium is going to put them in it, right? If they're hypercalcemia, they're in an increased risk for having kidney stones. Um, they might also have catheters in place because they've been immobile for so long that they're going to be at risk for um catheter acquired urinary tract infections or caudies. The GI being that we're having decreased fluid, decreased movement, we're going to have increased risk for constipation, increased risk for fecal impaction. Our musculoskeletal is going to have a decreased muscle endurance, reduced strength, reduced mass, impaired imbalance, atrophy of muscles, decreased stability. They can even get foot drop. 
um, altered joint mobility, contractures, and then neuro, they're going to have alterations in perception. They might have ineffective coping. They're going to have changes to their emotion, depression, anxiety, changes to their self-concept, behavioral changes, withdrawal, increased sleep, and they can become hostile. So a lot of stuff can happen if you're not mobile. So this is the ADPI, your assessment, diagnosis, and all of that kind of broken down into system now. So if we're looking at the skin, we're going to want to assess the skin. We're going to be looking at the turgor. We're going to be looking to make sure that it's warm, it's pink. If they have some redness, is it blanchable? Is it not blanchable? If they're having bowel and urine incontinence, we need to make sure that that skin's not becoming excoriated, that there's no fungal infections going on down there. So intervention that we can do. Um, we want to make sure that we immediately identify those that are at risk. We want to make sure that we're turning them at least every two hours. We want to limit the time that they're sitting or staying in one position. Um, sitting in a chair for an hour at a time is a lot of pressure on a patient's sacrum. Um, it's also going to create stasis in their legs because their legs are bent. Um, so you want to instruct them to at least shift their weight at least every 50 minutes. We want to make sure that we're providing the appropriate skin and perineal care. We want to use proper beds and mattresses. There's um, for patients that are really bedridden and are at risk for skin breakdown, they have these beds called Clinitron. They're sand um, and they really help. They're very expensive though. Um, and then we want to monitor their nutritional intake, right? Making sure that they're getting enough fluid, making sure that they're getting enough protein. When we're talking about our respiratory system, right, we're going to be looking at our breath sounds, um, having the patient take deep coughs and breathing to keep those secretions mobilized, making sure they stay nice and hydrated, like 2,000 cc's of water a day to make sure that those fluids um, and those lung secretions stay nice and moist. We might have them doing an incentive spirometer, which we'll talk about that more when we get into perioperative care, but it's a wonderful device that helps pop those alveoli open to reduce our chances of atelectasis turning into pneumonia. Again, repositioning, right? If we keep moving you around, it's going to make sure that you're not laying on one lung and inhibiting it from fully expanding. Chest physiotherapy is going to be the percussion on the back of the chest to kind of help break things up, um, deep breathing and coughing and using suction. Your big goal here is to maintain the airway patency, achieve optimal lung expansion and a good gas exchange, and to keep those secretions nice and mobilized. When we talk about cardiovascular, we're going to want to assess the patients. We're going to want to compare their central pulses and their peripheral pulses. We're going to want to look to make sure that they're not having any deep vein thrombosis. Usually that's in one of the two calves. You're going to get a warm calf, a swollen calf, a painful calf. Um, if you start to see that happening on a patient, um, you want to make sure that you let the physician know they're going to have to order an ultrasound and start them on blood thinners. Ways that you can prevent that from happening is by putting those um, compression devices on them or putting TEDs on them. Um, if you suspect a clot, you need confirmation that there is no clot before putting one of those devices on it. You want to palpate for edema. Patients can have um, peripheral edema, especially in their feet and their legs, that you don't even realize it is edema until you touch them to check for edema. And then all of a sudden you realized, oh, wow, that's like a one plus on their feet. And that's because they're having the stasis of the fluids, um, orthostatic blood pressure and pulse, right? We're going to have that drop when we sit them up. We're going to have a further drop when they stand up, they're going to get dizzy from it. So what can we do? We can do the TEDs and SCDs. We can do DVT prophylaxis, make sure we have enough fluids, change the positions often, but make sure that when we're doing those position changes, it's gradual, right? We don't want them just to go from a laying position to a standing position. Um, they can do leg exercises to help promote that vascular return while they're in bed. Your big goal here is to maintain cardiovascular function, increase their activity tolerance, and prevent any thrombus formation. 
Next, we're going to move on to metabolic, right? So things that you're going to want to look at for metabolic is their intake, their output, their food intake, their weight, their urine and bowel elimination. You want to be looking at their lab values. You want to be looking at their skin injury. We do not want any skin injuries and we want to maintain our metabolism. So you might offer them a high calorie, high protein diet, supplements and vitamin B, vitamin C, If you have a patient who's nothing to eat or drink, they might need to go into where they're getting fed through the IV, the parental nutrition. Moving on to elimination. And so again, in the elimination, you're going to want to be looking at your INOs again. You're going to be want to looking at their bowel and bladder habits. If things are becoming distended, if their urine's becoming super concentrated, if their bowels are becoming super impacted. You're going to want to maintain hydration, stool softeners or laxatives, and bowel and bladder training might need to be um, put into the mix and definitely providing perineal care. Um, Your goal would be to maintain your urine and bowel elimination. Moving on to our musculoskeletal. So you're going to be assessing the patient's range of motion, their muscle tone and masses, And if they're starting to have contractures and contractures are where those joints actually become so stiffened that you can't even do passive range of motion with it. Um, Foot drop, they're no longer going to be able to pull their foot um, towards them. It's just going to stay in that dropped position. You want to monitor their gait. So things that we can do, we can do change of positioning every two hours range of motion, both active and passive range of motion. So the patient can do arm curls in bed. And if they can't, you can do them for them. You want to cluster care. So clustering care means that when you go in the room, you're going to do three or four or five things, and then that's going to give them the opportunity to rest. You don't want to be going in the room every 30 minutes, um, interrupting them from resting. Um, And then you might want to do physical therapy and occupational consults. Your big goal here is to keep that the body is aligned, stable, um, no skin injuries, and achieve optimal range of motion and prevent contractures from happening. Once the contracture happens, you're not going to be able to usually get it back without some type of procedure, um, some type of surgical operation. And the last slide we have on this is our psychosocial. So what are you going to want to assess on that? You're going to want to assess your patient's emotional status, their mental status, how their decision-making skills are, what's their sleep-wake patterns, and do they have coping skills and coping mechanisms? So things that we can do, we can identify and develop coping skills. We can help um, maintain their orientation by reorienting them. You can supply them with a clock and a calendar, making sure their whiteboard is up to date. You can talk to them about their treatments, the hospital routines. Um, We can involve them in their plan of care. Um, We want to maintain positive body image by performing or assisting with self-care. You know, it's amazing how many elderly patients you will see, both men and women, who could use um, some facial shaving and some body care. And everybody's too embarrassed to say, hey, you know, do you do you do you care if do you want do you want to clean up some of that on your face? Um, Do you want to shave? Because it happens and that actually makes them feel more like themselves. Um, so just be mindful of that. You want to definitely promote positive psychosocial. Um, and you know, your big goal is going to be able to maintain an acceptable sleep, wake, achieve socialization and complete their self-care independently. Um, and if they can't complete it independently, then they get to still have the self-care that they want with your assistance. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you.